Hello, my name is Father Jan Michael Jankis, and I'm a priest of the Archdiocese of St. Paul and Minneapolis in Minnesota in the United States of America. And it is my honor and privilege to be able to offer some mystagogical, musical musings on four of the longer elements that the congregation is invited to sing in the order of Mass. What I'd like to do is explore both the texts and a possible chant setting of these segments of the liturgy. But I have two preliminary things that I have to make clear. The first is that the English translation of these texts that I will be using is probably the text that will appear. But since I'm recording this in July of 2010, we are not absolutely sure that in all of its details, this is exactly the text. And secondly, the chant settings prepared by the International Commission on English in the Liturgy um, may or may not be employed by the bishops' conferences in their particular versions of the sacramentary. So I can't be absolutely sure that this will be the chant setting that will appear either. Nonetheless, I think this will be helpful as we explore the chant and texts for these four elements. The first is the glory to God in the highest, Gloria in excelsis Deo. There are really four segments in this wonderful text, the opening of which is a direct quotation from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verse 14. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of goodwill. Now notice the contrast between glory in the highest places being given to God and peace on earth being given to people. And then there's that outrider, namely, what kind of people? Well, says our text specifically, of goodwill. Unfortunately, that addition is a little problematic because the underlying Greek text, the actual biblical text, suggests that these are not people who have established their own goodwill, their own virtue, and then God blesses them with peace, but rather that they are people who, because God blesses them, discover their ability to live a life of virtue. So, with that in mind, it should be clear that this opening song of the angels is now placed on the lips of the congregation, especially in times of high festivity. Here's what our chant setting sounds like. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of goodwill. The tradition has this being intoned, possibly by the bishop or priest, but in the present form, that could actually be done by a cantor, or it could be taken up by a choir, or the entire congregation, right from the beginning, could be singing this wonderful opening phrase addressed to the triune God. The second part of the Gloria is addressed to God the Father specifically. And it involves first five verbs of praise and thanksgiving. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks for your great glory. And then a whole series of epithets trying to express in wonderful imagery what God the Father is, or more accurately, who God the Father is for us. Lord God, Lord Kurios in Greek, Heavenly King, Almighty Father. This wonderful sense of both the utter transcendence of God, Heavenly Sovereign, but also the God who is the benevolent protector and intimate lover of all that He has created, especially His covenant people, Almighty Father. Now, the chant here is quite wonderful because it builds and builds with the speech rhythm, but really gives you a sense that 
these verbs of praise are a panoply of statements about God's glory. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, heavenly King, O God, almighty Father. The third segment of the Gloria shifts attention away from God the Father, specifically to the second person of the Trinity, to Jesus Christ. And it makes two requests, have mercy on us and hear, receive our prayer. The Latin word actually underlying that is a little stronger. It's not simply a prayer request, but a very intense prayer. It begins, however, with five epithets, five appositive phrases. Once again, Lord Christ, Lord God. That same title given to God the Father is applied to Jesus. But then he has some distinctive titles as well. He is the only begotten Son. In fact, Son of the Almighty Father, whom we've already praised. And perhaps most wonderfully, in the midst of all of these epithets, he's named Lamb of God, a title that we'll explore later in another chant. There are two relative clauses that appear after that in the Latin, but it's in a threefold format. What I mean by that is, here in English, we actually treat them as sentences. You take away the sins of the world. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. But in Latin, they begin with the word qui, a wonderful way of saying that each of the five statements about how important Jesus is, is now spilling over into this who takes away the sins of the world, who is seated at the right hand of the Father. And uh, what I'd call your attention to is this. The verbs are in the present tense. This chant is not saying that once upon the time Jesus, in the past, took away the sins of the world. Once upon a time, in the past, was seated at the right hand of the Father and glorified. No. He stands forever to intercede for us. He is forever glorified at the right hand of the Father. A wonderful nuance in the prayer. Here's how the chant sounds. Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. The fourth and final segment of the Glory to God is slightly deceptive. We hear the text, for you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ. And we think that those three statements are simply addressed to the second person of the Trinity. What we don't pick up is that the sentence doesn't end with a period after Jesus Christ, but rather, you alone are the Holy One, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in the glory of God the Father. So that, in fact, the entire prayer, this chant, ends with glory once again being given to the triune God, just as it did at the very beginning of the prayer. So, we conclude the chant this way. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. 
I'd call her attention to just one final note. This chant in English is so clearly based on what the Liber Usualis calls Mass 15, or the Misa Simplex. I think you can tell it's almost simply heightened speech, a little formula that allows us to hear the grammatical structures underlying this entire wonderful text. But there is, just at the end, uh, a slight hint of the joy in the text. Did you hear the added notes on the word Christ and again on Father, especially when we come to Father, a genuine melisma on that syllable? And Amen, moving into an entirely different kind of range for the chant. It's clear that by this stage, we at the congregation, having sung all of these statements as the assembly, want to declare, so be it, this is true. We pledge ourselves to continue our praise and thanksgiving in the rest of the Mass.